Hello and welcome to Jane Austen's house. We are in the little village of Chawton, which is around 16 miles outside of Winchester. It's a very special village, not only because it is incredibly picturesque, it's full of thatched cottages and Georgian manor houses and all manner of beautiful things, but also because for the last eight years of her life, it was the home of Jane Austen until she came, until she passed away in Winchester. But it was here, within these walls, that she wrote and revised her six novels, which have been published and translated across the world and are beloved of millions of people. I'm Lizzie, I'm the director. I'm Sophie, I'm the collections and interpretation manager. And we're going to be um, talking you through some of our favourite objects in the collection. Um, so we thought we'd start with um, this object, which is in the drawing room. Um, and this is actually the bookcase that was in the rectory at Steventon, where Jane Austen grew up. And it belonged to her father, the Reverend George Austen. And you can just imagine, um, back at that time, Jane Austen was running around in the rectory, a little girl, and the bookcase would have been filled with her father's books. And we know that even though Jane Austen didn't have very much formal education, her father did let her have free reign of his library. So we can just imagine little Jane Austen running up to the bookcase and choosing a book, pulling one down and going off to read it. And she was incredibly well read and most of her education came from all the different books that she you know, just devoured by herself when she was a child. Her father ran effectively a school as well, didn't he? So they were experienced in educating, so they picked up the Austen sisters, they picked up all of this information from their brothers and the boys that were at school about them. I love the fact that this is one of the first pieces that visitors see because I think it really links Jane's upbringing and her childhood and actually the, the burgeoning writer of her because this is important to her story as a writer, isn't it, as well, this desk? Absolutely. Where it could be seen as so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think that the novels and the books that Jane Austen read when she was a young person and growing up um, really are so important to her story and you can see evidence of them in all of her works. She she alludes to other writers, she quotes, she name drops, she has her characters reading other yeah. books, so it's really there. They were a very literary family and I think those books are really just such an important part of her story. It's also lovely this desk because it not only references that, Jane Austen was a really prolific writer as a teenager and her, all through her early 20s. Then her father retired from being a vicar and they left Steventon, her childhood home. And over the next few years, the Austen family wandered all through there. They lived in Bath, they stayed with friends and family, her father died. And then in 1809, they came here to Chalkham Cottage. And from there, we then see a real resurgence of Jane's writing and it's an incredibly creative time for her. She goes back to things that she would have written while she was at Steventon near this bookcase and she also creates extraordinary new novels. And that actually links us on to the next object. The and next object, about. yes. So the next object that we're going to talk about is probably the one that most visitors are, I think, most excited to see and it's the one that often brings a tear to people's eye. Um, so this is this extraordinary little delicate table which Jane Austen wrote at. Um, it's in the dining room, although obviously it's very small and light and it could easily be picked up and carried around and I, that's how I imagine Jane Austen used it. Um, but we know that she often did write in the dining room and she would place the table by the window so she got the light coming in from the window um, to, write, to light up her writing paper. And she would write on very tiny, delicate little pieces of paper. So even though this table looks completely impractical to write a novel at, um, we know that Jane Austen managed it by writing on these very small pieces of paper, and she would hide them if so. If she had somebody coming. So there's a lovely um, uh, legend of Jordan Cottage, which is that one of the doors squeaked, and Jane Austen wouldn't have it mended. She wouldn't have it oiled because she wanted to hear if anyone was coming through the door, so that she had time to hide her little tiny piece of paper that she was writing her novel on underneath something else, under a book or a letter. Um, because it wasn't really the thing, it wasn't very genteel for a, a lady to be writing a novel, so she didn't really want to be seen doing that. But her family were proud of her writing, weren't they? And she was very much, she was seen as a great, uh, she, was wonderful, she was a wonderful aunt. 
Jane Austen was a wonderful aunt, and her family were quite proud of her writing. Yes. And she advises her nieces, doesn't she, on their novels, which sadly never saw the light of day because they sound they sound really <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, 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 they sound very very funny. And it's actually in her writings to her nieces that we get a real sense of how Jane Austen felt about her writing. She describes it as working on a piece of miniature, and she gives wonderful advice about how to use three or four families in a country village. And that's how you take your writing, and it's how you create your characters. And it's real insight to see how she thought about writing, how she created her own novels, especially from this tiny, tiny, tiny little table and this tiny yeah. place and this extraordinary worlds that come out of it. I think it's one of the things that we find fascinating is that although Jane Austen's cast of characters is small, and the scenes that they go to, they don't travel very widely. But the way she explores human emotions and the, the characters and the things that they experience in their growth is huge, even though it's from a small place and from potentially a small plot line. She creates these gigantic immortal characters and they were created and they were revised here, which is something that never fails to give me goosebumps when I think about it. You kind of get, you get carried away, especially at the moment, everything is being cleaned and we've got extra sanitising everything in and it's all very, we get down to the base operations of running a museum and then there'll come a time where you walk in the dining room and you just sit there and you think, this, this, is, where this is where it happened. Yeah, yeah. Some of Pride and Prejudice was revised there. Emma was written from there and it's just, it's just goosebumps, isn't it? It is. And actually that's why the table is so symbolic to so many people, I think, because it's such a humble little thing. It's just, you know, it's a tiny object um, she wasn't, uh, you know, demanding a big desk to write at. She wasn't demanding lots of space. She probably had people bustling around her doing housework whilst she was sitting at the table and trying to write. So it's an incredibly human thing, and I, I think it's something we can all really relate to, particularly after six months of lockdown where we've all been trying to work at home, you know, the same thing, somebody's hoovering behind you or something like that. It's exactly what Jane Austen was going through. So I think, you know, we all feel kind of a lot more respect for her perhaps than we had I, I think a great connection to her through this because yeah. she was, we know, freedom of movement for women in her time period wasn't that easy. She always had to sort of be taken somewhere by her brother and dropped off. She couldn't just Take herself anywhere, and it's something that we and there's always a constant fear of illness. It sees through her letters and actually through a lot of her novels, actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been a time of increasing appreciation. Well, it's always there. We yeah. always appreciate her relevance, but it's been fascinating. It's interesting, isn't it? There's been an awful lot of talk about how um, throughout the whole of the lockdown period, people were really starting to understand. Jane Austen so much more, um, perhaps not even thinking about her work, but the characters, Regency life, the way that, you know, suddenly everyone's horizons were so much smaller, you couldn't meet very many people, you couldn't go very far, and that's exactly the case for Jane Austen's life. And I think anyone who comes to Jordan and walks around a little bit, you see, I mean, it's a, it's a one-horse town, Really, there's one village street, you know, there's there is our favourite horse. We do have our favourite horse that goes past the house every day. We do, it's right, it's a dick. We do, do, right. do, do the horse <laughs> clip flopping cover. Um, and that's just sort of, you know, that was daily life. And what something that I really love about um, Jane Austen and her sort of this little position that she took up in the dining room window is this idea that even though there wasn't very much going on in Taunton, she did want to see what was happening and she'd be sitting by the window and she'd be writing but she'd also just be keeping an eye out for what was going on in the village and um, in, in those days Jordan was actually a bit busier and a bit noisier because it was on the main road to, between Winchester and London so she would see the carriages going past, she'd see people on horseback, she'd see her neighbours you know walking up and down the street and she would you know, I think just tune in to those sort of human stories, and I'm sure that some of those got worked into the novels. Well, I love particularly Emma. I mean, Emma yeah, Emma's a wonderful novel. For those who haven't read it, it's as much it's as much about the village and the people of the village as it is about the heroine. And I love to think of Jane sitting at that window yeah. and plotting those characters and seeing people go up and past, up and down. Which she what she was living here when she when she wrote Emma. So there is every possibility that those experiences and the things she saw outside of her window would have influenced that novel. And I think Emma, for me, is particularly poignant of that, sort of that bustle of everybody knowing everybody and in and out of the cottages, and I think that would have been very similar to her, her lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
Um, so we're going to go on to another of our favourite objects, and this one really is, I think, one of my favourite objects. Um, so we're going to move on from Emma to Mansfield Park. Yes. Um, so this is actually, it's two objects. So we have two really beautiful um, topaz crosses. This is a case of art mirroring life, um, because these are two pieces of jewellery which Jane and Cassandra's brother, Charles, brought them back from um, what he was in the Navy, and he brought them back for his sisters as presents. And Jane writes this really charming letter to Cassandra um, saying that, you know, their brothers bought them these presents and he's going to be well scolded for spending all his money on his sisters. And you can just tell that even though she's sort of, you know, affecting to be sort of a bit cross with him, she's really, really pleased. She's really very fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She's thrilled. And then obviously um, the same story pops up in Mansfield Park. Absolutely. Mansfield Park, again, I will say this a lot. It's one of my favourite novels. It's a bit, it's interesting. It's very different in tone from Jane Austen's other novels, isn't it? She hasn't got a, yeah. it's very, very different from Pride and Prejudice, which is one of people's favourite. It doesn't have a very sparkling, witty heroine. Um, and it can be quite dark in times. And in fact, it's actually a novel where Jane Austen does reference the slave trade. Uh, the landowner of Mansfield Park, Sir Thomas Bertram, actually has plantations in Antigua and Jane does mention this and it is something in her family history that they were abolitionists and it is a fascinating just that little insight into the contemporary thought of the regency and the politics and where Jane Austen stood on it if she could ever be seen to be standing anywhere on politics it's not always that clear but there is a mention of it here in this the heroine Fanny Price her brother William has gone off to sea and he's a midshipman and he comes back and he has bought her a necklace just like the necklace that Charles bought Jane and Cassandra. And I think it's really lovely to see in this text, actually we can make parallels between Jane's affection for her own brothers. She was one, she had lots of brothers, and she was really close to them, particularly her two, well actually Anne Henry wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, was, she, yeah. had, she loved her brothers, they were really, they were really a close-knit family. Which I always think quite interesting because she was, she seems to have you know, three sisters. Yet yeah, yeah. she was only one of two and with all these boys everywhere. But I think that relationship between Fanny and William Price is just charming, isn't it? It's it is. He's so protective yes. and loving of her. And obviously Fanny Price is some in some ways a bit of a difficult heroine to get on board with. You know, yeah. she she takes a bit more work than Elizabeth Bennet. Um, but I think that it's, you're right. It's through her relationship with her brother that you really come to sort of see. Her worth. Up until then, she's been, um, you know, surrounded by characters who don't. That's really strong. They don't her as well, aren't they? She's quite yeah. a she's quite a shy character. I think possibly if she was written today, we'd possibly see her as having anxiety or some kind of those issues. So she could be seen as a through a spectrum of being quite a, a prude, for want of a better word, and quite dowdy. But actually, you see her reactions to things, and it's it's quite an emotive, uh, anxious reaction that she has. To things. She's quite sad a sad character, uh, rather than you see these sparkling characters of Emma and Lizzie Bennet. And she's, 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 a, she's a sad, worried But then she needs she. that support, doesn't yes. she? So actually, when she's with her brother, who she adores and trusts, yeah. she kind of blossoms, she blossoms. and she, you know, absolutely, and that's obviously how she is with Edmund as well. I'm not sure if we're selling Mansfield Park very well, <laughs> if you haven't read it, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. I think that's something that's really interesting about so many of Jane Austen's novels. Um, that I probably embarrassed to say how many times I've read Prime and Precious, I couldn't tell you. But I think people come back and they read her novels again and again and again, and they're a real solace through life. And it's something not only through lockdown we found, but that people have been finding for generations. We know that the painter G.F. Watts had Jane Austen read to him as poorly, as did Winston Churchill. Her books were prescribed to soldiers at the front who were suffering from shell shock. So they are a great comfort. But more than that, Every time you read them again, you get something you different. Something new. Yeah. And it's just astonishing. I know every time I go back to Emma, I'm just astonished by a new sentence in a different place that just feels like it could have been written yesterday. And rereading Mansfield Park recently, again, you just get a sense of that emotion and that struggle coming through for Fanny Price in a, in a way that just completely transformed the novel. I think, oh, actually, what you ask you, I've read a lot of Jane Austen first as a teenager. Mm. And then to go back to it again over successive decades has been really interesting to change my perception of the characters. And now working in her house and seeing the objects, I think 
changes that again I would what there do you, what so do you think? Hilarious. Yeah no I think we feel exactly the same. We probably had a very similar <laughs> Dana's story. I mean I met her in 1995. Yes so did I. <laughs> <laughs> so so did did I that. That. Yeah. Um but no I think absolutely you come back to her and you discover new layers of meaning and I think that it all really links into what we were saying about the writing table is that she focuses on these very small stories very sort of, you know, close-knit groups of characters in small village locations, but actually she's telling this universal story yes. of the human condition, yeah. and something that I always think is, I don't know, it's an interesting um, criticism that people make of Jane Austen is that she doesn't deal with, you know, the big, um, you know, the big stories that were going on in her time. She lived through such a sort of, you know, difficult time, Britain was at war, but she hardly mentions that. There's that tiny little mention of the slave trade in Mansfield Park, but she doesn't really she doesn't deal with these big political issues. But I think she is. She's yes. just doing it in this incredibly subtle way, and she does it through, you know, a look or yes. a word. She doesn't write, you know, sort of big treatises on no. what should be going on. But I think it's just so much more subtle than that. And as you know more about sort of you know, the period and what's going on in the world, you start to tune into those things, which is just so fascinating. It's just extraordinary, and I completely agree. I think the more you, if you just wear Jane Austen for any of the novels once, read them again, and you will feel like you are reading a different book the second time you read it. And then you read it the third time, and it's a completely different novel again. And every time you reread them, I promise you, you will find something new, and you'll find a new layer of nuance, or you'll just see a sentence that will just sparkle out at you as just being extraordinary. Um, so the last little bit that we're going to talk about is a little bit different. Um, it's not quite as nicely linked <laughs> to Jane Austen's writing life, um, but it's a, it's a, a funny um, little Regency toy uh, called a Bilba Catch, or a Cup and Ball. I'll try and do it again. Jane Austen was really good at this. This is. <laughs> this, ob this obviously isn't this the one we're talking you about. you are demonstrating okay. it's rather than me. It's okay, okay. Okay, let's have a go. And apparently this is a right of initiation for Absolutely. all Jane Austen and yeah. house directors that they have to do this. You have to get good at this. Yeah. You have to get good at it. Okay, um, that's enough for now. Let's talk about the real one. Let's talk about the real one. <laughs> so, um, the object that we have on display upstairs is um, actually an ivory uh, version of the cup and ball and it's one that Jane Austen had, owned and played with um, and we know from the writings that her nephews and nieces um, compiled in uh, a memoir of Jane Austen which was the first biography that was written of her by her, her nephew and um, his, you know, his siblings um, that Jane Austen was really good at it so she could do it for hundreds of times in a row. So she obviously had a misspent youth she practicing. She did, yes. Um, and it just links back into what you were saying earlier, Lizzie, about how she was a brilliant aunt. So Jane Austen famously never got married, didn't have children of her own, but she was so close, um, as Cassandra was as well, with all of her nephews and nieces from all of her brother's children. Um, and they used to come and stay. So even though Jordan Cottage isn't a very big house, once you've already got you know four women living in here and a couple of servants, they would have a spare room and the nephews and nieces would quite often come and stay and in that period coming to stay didn't mean a night or two, it meant weeks and weeks. So um, it's basically um, free babysitting, isn't it? <laughs> the brothers would farm, farm their kids out to Aunt Jane and Aunt Cassandra and then they would have to you know, look after them and come up with ways to entertain them. And they had a phenomenal number of nieces and nephews, didn't yeah. they? Yeah, so they would come in you know, little groups um, Chawton House up the road, so um, Edward's family were there for some period as well, so some of them would be staying there and they'd walk down, so there's all of these children around. Um, the garden here at the house was quite a lot bigger then, it was sort of two or three acres in size, and they would have you know, flower borders and vegetables, but they'd also have woodland, so we know that the children would be out there, they had animals, they had donkeys, We'd love yeah. some donkeys, we don't have enough space. We had John, Jane Austen's donkey cart, which she used to get set up and she used to drive it into Alton, which is only about two miles away, and I think yeah, it was it's one mile. Yeah, and Jane Austen was also a really great walker, so she we knew that she would be out there, you know, going for walks, walking into Alton, going to see neighbours across the fields. So, I mean, I know that we don't want to say that 
too much of her life, you know, went directly into the novels, but she was a bit of a Lizzie Bennet in her own way. I think she also really things. wanted to be Lizzie Bennet. It's interesting that she writes about Pride and Prejudice as her own darling child, uh, which is just fascinating on so many different levels. It would take yeah. a whole different talk to analyse Jane Austen's approach to her novels as children, but it's she has a particular fondness of Lizzie Bennet. She, she loves this character that she's created. And there's a really lovely thing in the letters, which I love when she writes to Cassandra. She's gone to see the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy in London, and she is looking for portraits of particularly Jane Bennett and Lizzie Bennett. And she finds somebody who she thinks could be Jane Bennett, or Mrs. Bingley, she calls her. But she doesn't find a portrait of anyone who looks like Mrs. Darcy. And she, she thinks it's because Mr. Darcy holds the portrait too precious that he doesn't want it to be on public display, which I just think is gorgeous. And shows so much about her sense of inner world and these characters are really alive for her, which yeah. is amazing considering how relevant they are to so many people today. That actually Jane is still, she's looking, she, I just love the fact that she wants to meet Lizzie, Lizzie yeah. Bennett as so much as we really want to meet Lizzie Bennett. I just think that's extraordinary that she's looking for this face in the crowd who would be her creation and that they have an independent life. And this is quite a long time after the novels. It's not just a way, yeah, it's not just a way that she's doing, so I just love that. And I also think that really shows so much about her sense of fun. Yes. It's kind of this sort of slightly tongue in cheek, you know, she's writing to her sister who really gets her, really understands her, and she's sort of having this joke about looking for the portrait. Um, and that actually leads us really nicely into talking about our last object, which is sort of our whole collection of letters, which um, we own that were written by Jane Austen, mainly to her sister Cassandra. Um, and we actually only own a handful, we own 13 letters, um, and there aren't that many in existence. We know that throughout her lifetime, Jane Austen would have written hundreds and hundreds of letters. Lots of those, unfortunately, don't survive. Um, Cassandra destroyed them after Jane's death, and there are lots of theories about why that would be. Um, and we think that it's most likely that there were things in the letters that were private that Cassandra wanted to protect, um, both Jane's memory and her legacy, but also she was writing about family members, people that were still alive. She just wanted to, you know, protect that. She, she, really she, she could be quite cutting. <laughs> she could be quite rude. <laughs> My theory is that they were either really, really rude, and that's why they were, or they were really boring. And they just oh. talked too much about Muslims. I think they were rude. They were rude. I think they were rude and scandalous, and she wanted to <laughs> maintain Jane Austen's, you know, you know, her like her legacy and her reputation. Um, so we have one letter on display at the moment, which is actually a really interesting one. It's not written to Cassandra. It's actually written to the Royal Librarian, um, to the Prince Regent. And it was written in 1816. And what's happened is there's been a little flurry of letters between Jane Austen and um, James Daniel Clark, who was the uh, Prince Regent's librarian. Um, and he has written to Jane Austen to suggest what her next novel should be about. And she writes back to him and she basically just says, absolutely not. I think we're one of the first documented examples of mansplaining. Yeah, it's brilliant. So we have this character who hasn't written his own books, telling Jane the plots that she should write. And they're basically to tell the story of his life, aren't yeah, they? Just yeah. extraordinary. And she's just like, I'm sorry, I have to do this in my own way. You know, I couldn't... She's very polite. She's very sort of tactful and she says, you know, what you're asking me to do is something I absolutely couldn't do. I need to keep to the way that I write. And it's just such, it's really inspiring, isn't it? Because yes. it just really, you think, yeah. She I must a, do this in my own way. And in a period when women were not particularly used to being yeah. able to stand up and say no to a man. who And he was a very senior man in a very in a I think it's position. so brave for her. I think it shows that strength of character that she has as well. And certainly, potentially, also, dare I say, a streak of bloody-mindedness. Yeah. Because she is this man... The, so the, the plot line of the novel is one, he suggests, is to tell the basically the story of him. But the other one is to look at the love story of the Hanoverian dynasty of Prince Regent and his family, which could have been quite popular in a world. Her novels were good sellers in her time, but this is a real historical novel. It was very popular at the time. It would have been, potentially, especially if it was still promoted by these people, it could have been a fantastic success. And she says, no, I am doing my thing. I am doing it my way. and." I think that's just fantastic to see her going, 
I know. I think what I love about Jenny is all the way through. She knows she's good. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. that's what's astonishing, and I think that's what's so. I think that's one of the reasons why her novels are so inspiring, and again, why actually, particularly the characters of it is Lizzie Bennet and Emma. The, her other female characters are not so sure of themselves. Mm. They are different characters, but they know when they're right. Yeah. Like all of her characters, all of her female characters, they know they're right, and they know that they are intelligent. Yes. And they are unashamed of being right and intelligent. Some of them get things wrong all the time, <laughs> but they have an innate confidence. Yes, it's just they have a belief in themselves. Yeah. And you're right, that is really inspiring. And I'm sure that that was part of what she wanted to do. And it's something that she was definitely trying to instill mm. in her nieces. You know, she was trying to send them out into the world to be yeah. strong, creative women, which is obviously exactly what we're trying to do too. We want everyone who comes around the house to, you know, take away something of that inspiration that even if you are in a tiny, tiny house, tiny table, tiny piece of paper, you can still write something that is extraordinary and huge and, you know, everything is about small. Yes. So, go and pick up your tiny pieces of paper, write your extraordinary novels, and one day, when your house is open to the public and people are visiting it, don't forget that you need to make a space big enough for the place to have a good, large gift shop when people can come visit. But more than that, come and see us. We are reopened. We're open Thursday to Sunday. You do need to pre-book at the moment. But please come and experience this extraordinary place for yourself. Bring a notebook, bring a pencil, sit in the garden and write your novels. Or just soak up the atmosphere and enjoy.